Okay. Um, I'd like to welcome uh, Professors Donahue and Professor Flavin this morning. Um, Scott Flavin is the conductor of the Henry Mancini Institute and a violin professor at Frost. And M Maggie Donahue is the uh, director of the Woodwind uh, program and also the clarinet professor. So, and they're going to be talking to us about performance anxiety. And uh, if anyone wants to play as well, you'll have that opportunity. And you can also post questions in the chat. So welcome. Thank you. Great to see you all. Good morning, everybody. Hey, everyone. <laughs> so I guess, um, do, you, do you all suffer from performance anxiety or nerves when you play? Oh, <laughs> yeah. we got some no's and we got some yeses. Yeah. Yeah. I, I mean, I, I personally have been playing, boy, almost 50 years. I'd say 40, 48 years I've been playing the violin and I still get nervous for various things. Uh, the good news is that there are strategies to help you with that. But first of all, maybe we can go around and I don't know if they can just call out or what. what. I know we have a lot of... Um, they have the, they can unmute themselves and they can also uh, write in the chat. Great. I guess the first question would be, if you have performance anxiety, what kinds of things bother you? What's like your biggest problem maybe or your biggest concern when you're performing? Anybody? Sometimes it's physical things like breathing shallow or finger shaking. And sometimes it's um, more cognitive. It might be focus. Sometimes even vision is affected. That happens to me sometimes. So there are lots of things that can happen when the adrenaline kicks in, physical things that happen to you. Anybody have anything? Oh, oh shaky. shaky hands. Yes. Yeah. Oh, hallelujah. Me too. Right here. I'm with you on yep. that. Yeah. Lots of shaky, sweaty. Yes. Yeah. Worried about messing up a note. Yeah. Butterflies in the stomach. Absolutely. Yeah. You know what? I think we're all in this <laughs> together, right? As performers. And I think it's beyond um, musicians athletes, uh, public speakers, anything where you are um, in an event where people are watching or the outcome is uh, visible, <laughs> then I think we all um, experience some things that happen physically and like we said, cognitively. So it's thing to talk about this. We don't talk about it probably enough in private lessons, I think it mm. comes up specifically as needed, but it's super important. One of the things I would say is that performance, nerves, and anxiety is a good thing in a way because it shows you care. It shows that this is important to you. If you didn't care, if you walked out on stage, you're like, whatever. There's going to be something probably missing in your performance, like that connection with the moment or feeling that, hey, this is the most important thing on earth, what I'm doing right now. So you don't want to beat yourself up about being nervous or having performance anxiety. It's actually a good thing because it shows that you really feel this is important as, as it should be when we're up on stage. Sure, absolutely. And I think that there are, there are some things we're going to talk about today. There are ways to mitigate the feelings the physical feelings or to lessen what goes on but there are also ways to work with them to change the mindset a little bit to turn them into something that you acknowledge as positive and use that to help your performance so we have sort of three general areas that we're going to talk about one is preparation and it's sort of a different we're going to go through that um, even though that's a different topic but it's so critical to controlling your nerves and to controlling any anxiety. And for that matter, any excitement, they, they um, evoke excitement and anxiety evoke the same physical um, reaction sometimes. And so we're going to go through preparation because it's vital to this. And then there's also calming the body and focusing the mind. So those are pretty much the three areas we're going to talk about. As we 
see in the comments, this is very personal and everybody reacts slightly differently to adrenaline um, and anxiety or excitement and different things will happen. So we want to make sure that you ask questions either along the way or at the end so that we are sure to address your particular issues. And if anybody would like to play at some point and try out some of these skills, you are very welcome to. We can even talk you through some of the ways to deal with it and then you can play a little bit even if it's the scale or a phrase, whatever, whatever you want. It'll be fun to kind of see if, they, if you can get it to work right on the spot. Yeah, and I would say if we're gonna start talking about the, those, those three categories, I get asked quite often by students or in master classes, Professor Flavin, help me. I get nervous all the time. What do I do to, to not be nervous anymore? Well, always my first answer is, are you as fully prepared as you could be? Do you know this music cold? Uh, and oftentimes they don't, we don't. And so it's really, really important that we find strategies to really learn our music well and what that what that means basically is you start imprinting like a code in your brain of success you start changing your your inner computer circuitry to to move you toward toward success rather than failure and that helps us in so many ways in terms of confidence in terms of letting go and being free i don't know about some of you but one of my issues when i was your age was feeling like i was overthinking things you know, like thinking so much, oh my gosh, my fourth finger is gonna do this and I'm gonna drop my bow and I have to do this and I'm gonna do this and I'm gonna miss this shift coming up and then the G sharps are flat. And thinking so much of all the minutiae that I never felt free, I felt in prison in performance. And good preparation will help you get to that point where you're like, I like to use the analogy, you're like a general or an admiral, you're overlooking all the foot soldiers doing all the work and you're supervising it. So you get to see the beauty of the music and the mood and the shapes, and you're not down there doing all this stuff. Good preparation will help you do that. For sure. So let's talk about that preparation a little bit. Um, your repertoire choice is super important. And so if it's a situation where you get to choose what you're going to play, it isn't always, but sometimes it is, um, choose that repertoire that number one showcases your strengths, of course, and number two, and more important really, is repertoire that you feel connected to, that you love, that you really feel like you can express yourself and communicate because the ability to switch your mind to expression and communication in the middle of a performance is the key the real key to getting over nerves or working through nerves or letting nerves work for you. So that's super important. Your practice routine, of course, um, hugely important. You need to start early. You need to give yourself some due dates along the way. You need a date a couple weeks before the actual performance where you are ready to go. So you're not coming in at the last minute, but that you are letting the music sort of sit for the last couple of weeks and fully focus into what it is. You're not still dealing with notes and rhythms at that point. Um, I have a quick question for you guys. Have you, have you guys, and, and Professor Lesniak might answer too, have you guys had a workshop or anything on practicing, on practice strategies or anything like that? Well, they have, uh, private lessons. Um, yeah. My big thing with practice, and I'm sorry I'm interjecting here, is it's got to be about this. It's got to be about your brain. It's not about the beef. You know, it's not about the hamburger. <laughs> you know, that it's how we control it. And one thing that I did not do at your age, I did not practice well. I loved the violin and I loved to practice. And I practiced maybe six or seven hours a day. And I sort of needed to because out of that six or seven hours, I had maybe two or three hours that were really productive. The rest, I was enjoying making a sound and looking at myself in the mirror and looking really good. I had hair back then and imagining playing in Carnegie Hall with Itzhak Perlman, you know, accompanying me. 
you know, that kind of stuff. We can't work at 100% focus all the time, but if you try to put, you know, little segments of that, we'll talk about this idea, but just remember that good practice is about engaging your brain and you can even practice without your instrument. There was a great pianist, Glenn Gould. Have you ever heard of Glenn Gould? You should check him out. The guy is incredible. And he, wonderful pianist, he used to practice without a piano. And you see sometimes, I don't know if you've seen pianists practice like on a tabletop and they're tapping with their fingers and it's sort of silly. He got to the point where he didn't even need to do that. It was all in here. And uh, sometimes like if I'm at the dentist or something and I have a long procedure, I'll practice a phrase in my head. And it takes a lot of focus for me to do and I've been practicing a long time. But remember it's in your brain. Really, really good. So. So I'm going to share a strange little story that has stuck with me all many decades um, about preparation and nerves. And this is kind of silly, but it on some scale, I think we've all felt it. Um, sixth grade, right? So I've been playing a year. I had to play a solo in front of the entire school. And naturally, I was really nervous. It was one of those big page long solos from the back of Rubank, right? So a couple weeks before I was in a, my lesson and my teacher said, well, you're nervous about this. It's like, yeah, I'm nervous. And he said, why are you nervous? Well, because I have to play it in front of the whole school. No, no. I mean, why are you nervous? And I said, well, I feel like I'm going to mess up. Mess up what? Well, mess up in general, play wrong notes, not sound good. And he just kept going and going with the questions until he went like almost note by note. Are you afraid of this note? No, I can play that note. This one? No, I'm okay there. And he went through the whole thing and it turned out to be like two or three notes. And I remember it specifically high ones that I was afraid I would miss. And he whittled it all down to really all my anxiety was on two or three notes. And then he said, well, okay, let's get that. Let's make those notes as comfortable as all the others. And so we spent the next two weeks working on these high notes till I felt comfortable. And then I could go play it. And it went well and it was all fine. And that has stuck with me all this time going from a Rue Bank one pager to a full concerto, I still go in and say specifically, what is it I'm afraid is gonna happen? And then I work on it. So it has really um, stuck with me that idea of preparation and being really specific about what it is you're nervous about. Sometimes it's silly. Sometimes it's the walking out on stage part or the bowing, or wait, I'm, whose hand am I supposed to shake first? What do I do? And so you just prepare for that and you prepare for everything and then it's not new. Then you're already there and things go wrong, even with the best of preparation and that's something you just let go at the moment and you just, communicate and express and um, that's a meaningful experience for your audience, which is what the whole point of all this is, right? So anyway, that was a long story, but um, important I think because it really sticks to and speaks to how uh, preparation can get you past nerves, which are very natural. Um, okay, so should we talk a little more about preparation? Yeah, can did I? Did you guys see the poll I did? Yes. Okay. Yeah, it's looking, looking pretty good. 44% always get nervous, 32% sometimes. Yeah. For me, it was also the unpredictability of it. Like I could play in front of 10,000 people and not be nervous sometimes. And then sometimes I'd play at a retirement home for a bunch of deaf old people. Be terrified. That unpredictability was a problem for me. But uh, an another strategy that you may have heard this all from your teachers, but uh, so really using your brain when you practice, be become detectives. You all, I know it 
from talking talking to Dr. Lesniak and knowing your teachers, uh, you all are really brilliant. You're really smart, caring, good people. You have a lot of ability to self-diagnose your issues. And you probably hear your, your teacher's voice in your head too saying, oh, you know, you gotta do this, you gotta do that. But the greatest thing, if you can start doing it when you practice, is figuring it out yourself. You have that ability. So for me, a strategy is if you're not used to doing this, put a timer on. Put a timer on two minutes and say to yourself, in this, in this two minutes, I am going to become a detective for what I stink at. And I'm going to find ways of fixing it. How do you find ways of fixing things? Well, there's a finite number of solutions. It's not infinite. So if you're totally lost, try, try something, experiment with something. But sometimes it can help to put on a little timer just with a few minutes, because if you really focus when you practice, it can be exhausting if you're not used to doing it. Um, you know, I mentioned I practiced all those hours when I was your age and, and maybe 30% of them were useful. I mean, now if I have 30 minutes free to practice, I'd say a good 28 minutes is useful is really high quality usefulness. And that's not because I'm a genius. It's because I eventually figured out how to focus. You can do that too. So start small, start with a, a few minutes and maybe a week later you add on another couple of minutes. And pretty soon, you know, you're, you're solving problems really well and really quickly. The other thing I like to tell my students, because you know, college life is busy, it gets really, really busy. Your time is precious. You don't have all day to sit around. You want to get things done and you want to move forward. When you start working on just a little bit of this focus practice, you're going to be amazed at how much you can accomplish. You all, all have that capability and it's, it's really exciting when it starts to happen. I don't know, just with, with head nods, how many hate practice feels boring? Oh. No, okay, good. So you like practice, good. Yeah, I was not a huge fan of practicing to learn. <laughs> But now I get so excited about it and I try to instill that in my students. And, and yeah, it's, it's about, hey, I, I'm, I have a reason for practicing and things are going to get better. You all can do that. Yeah, absolutely. Um, one thing to remember in your practice is to practice performing. Performing is, is a separate uh, entity from your music. So you have to practice that. That's part of the preparation as well. And that could mean recording yourself so that you get a one time straight through and then take an honest assessment of it. It could mean pulling a friend after we're no longer isolated, grabbing a friend to come in the practice room and listen to you and you perform for them so that you're getting used to the sense of performing as opposed to playing what you've practiced. And it's very, very important because as we've been saying, the preparation is key, right? And we don't want experiences that are first when you're performing. So you want to have done it more than once before you get on stage. So even if that means um, recording yourself on your phone, that's a performance. And it, there's a certain heightened feeling to that, and that's what you're trying to get at. Then you can take those recordings, of course, and diagnose them, as Professor Flavin was saying, and really critically listen to what's going on, what's good, what's not, acknowledge your strengths, as well as looking for those challenges and weaknesses that you can then dive into. I get lots of students, um, and it's not new, this has been for, uh, you know, the 25, 30 years I've been teaching university. I get many, many, many students who come in and are disappointed because it doesn't go as well as it went in the practice room. I can play that in the practice room, but when I come in here, I can't do it. And that I think, there are two reasons for that, and it they completely align with performance nerves and what we're talking about today. One reason is that sometimes what we feel as being able to play something is that we got it once or twice in the midst of a whole practice session. So we know we can do it, but the question is, can we do it nine times out of 10 
or even better, 10 out of 10. And then the other is, um, have we practiced just warming up and playing straight through? Or is it, do we warm up and then try some things, play a little this, play a little that, and then work your way into a piece and then feel like, oh, well, now I've got this. But really, do you have it now on the spur of the moment, right now when it's called up? That's the real test. And that's something you can work on in the practice room and you can get that feeling of confidence so you know when they ask you to play something, you can play it. There's a great violinist, Nadja Salerno Sonnenberg, and her strategy before a big concert is like a week before or two weeks before, she'll put on her gown and her shoes. She'll put a chair or a coffee table in the middle of her apartment and stand on top of it like a stage. And she'll turn up the heat and she'll put lights on her and she'll run through her entire program. And she calls it battle conditions. So she's trying to make it even more difficult than when she actually performs on stage. And that element of, hey, there's no take two. There's no warm up. You know, you've got to go. And if you mess up, you mess up. You're going to take note of those things. But this is battle conditions, all steam, full steam ahead. You got to get through it. And you can learn so much doing that. Um, I mean, I don't wear ball gowns, but you know, a tuxedo and a jacket, it feels very different than in a t-shirt and shorts. So, um, yeah, I mean, that's, I think if we can replicate the concert situation, that can really help us get used to it. If you think about it, remember when, I don't know if you remember trying to learn to ride a bike. I mean, riding a bike was either painful on your knees or it was scary and involved so many steps, your mom or dad telling you to do this and do that. And now for most of us, riding a bike involves getting on the bike and go. It's like two steps, it used to be 20 steps. So same thing with performance. You know, you, you start working this way and it becomes one thing that's manageable rather than all these little tiny things. So that, uh, <laughs> the battle conditions, that is super important. And that leads into, um, well, first of all, at least to a couple things. I think the spirit is absolutely right. Um, the, her take on the battle conditions is one way to look at it. Another way to deal with it is to turn that into something more positive, mm -hmm. turn your nervousness into excitement. And even that little mental shift from turning the same physical feelings from negative to positive can do a lot for your mindset as you walk out on stage. Um, I've, not to disagree with <laughs> Nadia because, you know, she's had a lot of success. But I, for me, it's important to treat it positively in my mind. Um, I also think it's important to acknowledge that these physical things are going to happen and that's exactly what she is doing. Um, and with the lights and the heat. So for me and most of my students, the things that happen are, are the things you've mentioned. Shortness of breath, not being able to control a deep, full breath, which as a wind player, you know, is critical. Shaky hands, sweaty palms, all of that really, really affects every instrument really, certainly as clarinetist, for me, it's really bad. So what we do with the understanding that you can mitigate or lessen these things, but chances are they're not going to disappear entirely. So we need to learn how to play through them. So we actually practice them in the heart, the faster heart rate, the shallower breathing. And so sometimes I send the students out in the hall and they do a couple laps up and down. We do jumping jacks in the studio, run in place, anything to get the heart rate up because the, heart, the increased heart rate is what causes all these other things to happen. So then the hands maybe shake, not so much, but a little bit, definitely sweaty palms, faster heart, shallower breathing, and then you practice or you do all those things try to get that all to happen and then you run through your program so you can see what's going to happen on the in the moment mm, maybe i need more breath marks written in here than i thought i did 
in a perfect world, I can make it through this piece with breaths here and here and here. But when my heart rate increases and my breathing gets faster and shallower, well, I need more. So I'm gonna put some emergency breaths in here so I can handle this if it happens. And so all these kind of things, it's in, we ask a lot, you know, well, what happens? Is it your breathing? Is it your hands? That's important because it's gonna always be the same things for you. So part of alleviating the anxiousness is knowing that you can deal with these things when they happen. And I'm sure that's different for string players, brass players, wind players, keyboard singers, whatever your area is, there are probably um, subtleties to these things that, that are more important to you. But the key is for everybody to figure out what those things are and then learn how to live with them, really. Um, and then there are ways to lessen them as well. But acknowledge that they're gonna be there then you're not part of the anxiety is not well what if because you've already dealt with what if neat yeah and i would add on the other side of the coin uh if you think about why we have shaky hands and why our heart rate goes up it's it goes back to caveman days it's about the fight or flight response you know and not that we're going to get attacked by the audience, but we have that same hmm. feeling and it makes our heart rate go up to protect ourselves. And our body tends to go inward to protect ourselves. And so our shoulders go up, we hunch over, we use our muscles of our back to protect ourselves. And it's sort of a natural kind of thing under stress to have that fight or fight, fight or flight response. Uh, adrenaline starts pumping through our system that accounts for the shakiness are we become hypersensitive to sounds and vision. So obviously, and you've probably heard it before too, a great way to work on that is to take a couple of deep breaths. So, you know, breathing in through your nose and holding it for a few seconds and then letting it out for a few seconds through your mouth. Try that, you know, next time you, you feel those feelings, do that, you know, three of those deep breaths, even on stage before you play, and you will find you're, you're going to be calming your heart rate down and the adrenaline may not be pumping as, as strongly. I mean, obviously, yeah, we do have to be able to deal with it and have strategies physically to deal with it. Uh, but that can also help on the other side of the coin. So we had a question from Facebook. Have you found that there's a correlation between your personality type or, or being extroverted or introverted and your level of discomfort in terms of performing? What do you think? I think that there can be a correlation, but I think in many cases, and I will go so far as to say most cases, not. Because I think there are, um, there are people that are very comfortable performing uh, musically that would be less comfortable in a group of people socially. So there's a social anxiety that doesn't transfer over to an on stage anxiety. Right. I think that happens a lot. <laughs> I'm one of them uh, for sure. I could play a concerto in front of oh, whatever number of people and feel pretty good if i have to um you know make small talk <laughs> in a small group much less comfortable and and i use the same things we're going to talk about coming up now to mitigate those feelings so i don't think it's always uh connected i also think you'll find the research well uh, research might be strong, anecdotal, I don't know, uh, lots of stuff written um, about the fact that many actors are actually introverts and uh, exhibit certain anxieties where once they become a character or they're acting, that's a place where they can really feel free and um, the creativity flows and the expression flows but in the actual life, much less so. So sometimes, yes, there's a certain anxiety I think that crosses over, but sometimes it's a place of freedom, the stage, a place where you can really 
express. So I don't think that <laughs> answers the question necessarily. I think sometimes yes, sometimes no. Um, so let's talk about how we lessen these things that happen to us with nerves. And so there's two general areas. Calm the body is one and focus the mind is the second. So let's start with the body. It's all the things we've talked about. When your heart goes up and that fight or flight kicks in a little bit, the adrenaline surging just does things to the body. And so how do we calm that? The most important, well, no, let's go back a step. And important is stretching and just trying to physically get some tension out of your body to acknowledge where you hold tension for yourself. It's different for everybody. And that the only way to find that out is to be in the middle of the situation and sort of... Um, checklist through your body and see where your tension is. I tend, I have discovered to hold tension. Um, this is not uncommon in shoulders and neck and also in my face. I feel, I feel it. Um, for some people, it's kind of in the spine. It could be anywhere. Um, but where it is, you want to work on getting rid of it. So maybe it's shoulder rolls, shake out your hands, loosen, shake your arms, do some neck, whatever you need to do to sort of release whatever physical tension you're holding. And then try to be mindful with it so that as it creeps in, you notice it happening and you can get rid of it. So Again, as a clarinet player, this is super important to me because any tension in the neck and the shoulders and the upper back transfers to the fingers. It's all connected. So if I wanna feel like I'm in control, technically, I have to be tension free up here. And so I know what my personal tendencies are and I constantly try to realign and relax is that something yeah that so guys this is why it's so exciting to have you all together like this because for string players everything she's saying it's a it's a real parallel right i mean we certainly the violin world and viola world we have that issue but also cellos and, and certainly bass players neck back and if there's tension there it's going to creep out here i think for a lot of us string players tension happens in the bow hold how many of you have been told, string players, that your, your bow holds tight or your fingers are locked or anything like that? Yeah, it happens to a lot of us. And so you can yell at yourself about, hey, I need to have four flexible fingers, but you might also think about where the root of that comes from. And quite often it's going to be the back and the neck. Um, yeah, so this is so wonderful to have you guys all together because we can learn from each other from our, our different instruments. Okay, so um, next, what I was going to go before, what I feel is the most important thing, uh, after you feel like you've acknowledged your tension, is the breath. And Professor Flavin started this conversation a little earlier. I want to go a little deeper into it because of the breathing, regardless of whether you play a wind or brass instrument or a singer, for everybody, the breath is key to controlling your heart and to controlling all of these physical things that happen to us when we get nervous. So the first thing that happens when the adrenaline kicks in is shallower breathing, and that's to try to oxygenate. I guess it's the body's way of trying to get more oxygen in, but it works not that way. And what happens is we start to uh, breathe shallower, and we don't breathe deeply from the diaphragm or just low and deep lung breaths. So taking several deep breaths, I mean, this is acknowledged even for anger management, right? 10 deep breaths before you say something you'll regret saying, um, all kinds of things. Breathing is the key to control. So my go-to is four slow breaths in, Four, four beats in, and then four seconds hold, and then four seconds release. And I just do a bunch of those until I feel a sort of calming 
that comes with that. Um, we do that a lot just to prepare before playing. That's just a general warm up, but it's more importantly a, a calming thing and it oxygenates your blood. It oxygenates your brain. Everything starts to come under your control a little bit more. So anytime you start to feel like things are slipping away from you, nerves wise, the deep breaths come in. The holding is important because it sort of stops that fast in and out flow of air. You breathe in slowly, hold and exhale. Super, super helpful. The key is to do this as part of your daily life so that you use it all the time. So when you need it, you remember to use it and you have it there in your toolbox to use when anxiety creeps in. And it can be any sort of anxiety. Uh, problem is all these things make sense and we all say, oh yeah, yeah, that's really good. That makes sense, that makes sense. But once nerves kick in, once adrenaline kicks in, it's kind of hard to remember some of these tools, right? We forget about it because we're more locked into what our current problem is. So if you practice these daily, this breathing and a certain mindfulness of what your body is doing, where your tension is, then it's always there for you when you need it. Yeah. I get a lot of, we all get, I think, a lot of inspiration from sports. If you look at a great tennis player, they're going to have certain rituals or certain things that they do every single time before they're about to receive a, a serve or something. That And it always, I think, involves breathing, um, but maybe feeling the balance of the racket, preparing mm -hmm. for a swing, the more we imprint this stuff and it, all it takes is repetition, thoughtful repetition. The more you imprint that, it becomes a part of you and part of your routine. And look what you're going to be able to do. You're going to be able to physically keep your heart rate down and, and physically be, be a little bit more in control of your body under stress. So every time you practice, think about that. It's especially a challenge for us string players, right? And maybe percussionists. Maybe we don't breathe as much as we should and we don't think about it enough. So. You know the old rule, I'm sure, string players, that on an up bow you breathe in and an out bow you breathe out. I mean, that's rather simplistic, but it's a great place to start when you do your warming, your warm up routine or you play your scales. Think about, you know, if you're playing four notes down, or you're going to breathe out for four notes, four beats, and breathe in on the up bow. It's a great way to start thinking about breathing. Yeah, super, super important. Um, so let's move on to the mind. What can we do? Um, oh, hold on. We have questions. Let's answer questions. Spinguin player, has your armature ever become shaky when you're nervous? If it has, how do you deal with it? Oh my goodness, yes. And that to me, that's one of the scarier things physically that happens. Um, the shaky hands, I feel like we can get through, but when the embouchure starts shaking, um, you get a little unintended vibrato and you feel like you're um, you know, not in control of your sound. And that's a spiral downward. If you're feeling like you're not controlling your sound, anxiety starts to creep up. So what I do for that is exactly the same thing. I start to focus on the breathing and I trust that good breathing and good air support as a wind player will counteract any shaky embouchure. The thing that you don't want to happen is that you start on the clarinet biting and I would think on all instruments adding tension into your embouchure because of that is another downward spiral. So you want the tension out, you want the control in. So if you rely on your air again, that overrides almost all of the physical things that happen. For me, it certainly overrides a shaky embouchure because the air is the fundamental tone producer. So if you put your thought process, okay, so here's the thing. Where you put your energy in your mind is where your results 
outcome. And if they're negative, the results go that way. If they're positive, the results go that way. If I focus, if I'm playing and I have a commissure and I start thinking about it and worrying about it, trying to control it, the shaky embouchure gets more shaky. If I switch to something positive and I think just breathe comfortably, it overrules and then the breathing gets better. So it's where you put your energy. So if I, if I want to focus on the embouchure, I focus on it in a positive way, not in a controlling way. So I might say to myself, okay, well just focus on the corners. Just re put your energy in controlling the corners of the mouthpiece or the chin or the top, whatever it is. Um, and don't focus on the shaky, focus on the fundamentals. And anytime you can go back to your fundamentals, the better the outcome, Cool, I think. And we had another question from Silvana about, have you ever not been prepared enough or not practiced enough when you had to perform? I think a lot of us can say yes, right? <laughs> I certainly can. I mean, we get pulled in many different directions and that sort of in a way becomes another skill set I guess you might say yeah uh, so yes I mean that does happen out of I think to all of us that we can't always be as fully prepared as we like and hey I don't know about you guys but one of the reasons I love being a musician and have been passionate about it since I was five years old is that there is no end game right we're always learning more and that might be daunting, might be depressing, but I, I think it's the reverse. I think it's really, really exciting because there's always a higher level for us. I still feel that way. I feel like a student sometimes um, about how, how much further I can go. So being prepared enough, what is enough? You know, uh, it's, a, it's a hard question. So I, I think it's very thoughtful, Silvana, for you to, to bring that up because absolutely, um, I think there are moments where we have to deal with that and we have to be somehow willing and able to be out on stage when we know that we're not quite as prepared. We want to try to be as fully prepared as possible, which I, I think we mentioned earlier, you know, you, go, you want to try to get prepared fully beforehand. Like for our students at the university, when they have a graduating recital, we, you know, we want to say, oh, how do, you, how do I know I'm prepared? Well, we want to say maybe two weeks before your recital, you should be at the point where you're spot checking the difficulties but you're running the program. The, the worst thing is for somebody to go into an hour long, you know, program of an hour worth of music and in the dress rehearsal be exhausted. And then what happens in the recital is they're exhausted. There's no, there's no uh, uh, strength. So we have to work differently as we progress. And I think, you know, you want to be performance ready, whatever that means to you, at least a couple of weeks beforehand. But yeah, I mean, Karen, that's a wonderful question. How do I know if I'm fully prepared? Wow, that's a big question. I had a teacher used to say, I should be able to get you up at two in the morning, call you, and you're going to play your whole program from memory for me. <laughs> <laughs> Yikes. <laughs> um, let's talk a little bit about focusing the mind, because I think we probably all have some chatter going on in our heads while we're trying to perform. And that's just, that's number one, a distraction. And that chatter isn't always uh, positive, right? Um, so we want to work on how to shift that mindset while you're performing. Um, there are a couple things to do. You basically want to quiet that inner voice entirely or as much as possible. I don't think entirely as possible, but as much as you can, you want to quiet that because Practicing and performing are different in this regard because when you're practicing, you're assessing, assessing, assessing. When you're performing, you should not be. You should be communicating, expressing, communicating, expressing. And that's why you have to practice performing, by the way, that we talked about earlier. Performing and practicing are very different. So as you're performing, you don't want to be critiquing yourself in either a positive or a negative way because let's say, so you flub some notes, some notes are wrong, it happens to all of us. 
every single time, nothing is going to go 100%, right? It just isn't. So we make some wrong notes. And in our mind, we're chastising ourselves. Oh, no, wrong notes, wrong notes, wrong notes. And while you take the time to do that, other notes are going by. So maybe now you're missing more notes than you would have if you would just let them go. Also, if you get something really difficult and it went really well for the amount of time as you're performing, not practicing, but in a performance, if you if your mind is congratulating yourself, whoo, I got that was really hard. I did it. Yay, I got it. Notes are going by. You're playing without focusing on the notes. And so maybe something that you didn't want to happen happens after the hard thing. And that actually happens a lot. Um, there are a couple clarinet pieces uh, that have big, difficult flourishes at the end and then just an easy low note you just hold. And it's amazing how many people miss that low note after getting the big flourish because they quit before the finish line, right? The mind's like, yay, I got that. And they forget the embouchure or they overblow or they do whatever. And that last easy note is a squawk or it's out of tune or whatever. It happens a lot. Quiet the chatter, express and save all the critique for the practice room. Um, when did you start playing? There was a question. Oh, when did I start? Fifth grade, 10 years old. Awesome. Which was pretty much the standard then. Oh, Samara, oh, I love Samara. She said that singing is calming for me. When I sing, sing, sometimes I think of nothing at all. That's wonderful, I think so. I mean, part of what we do, we have to be really analytical, right? as Dr. Donahue was saying, but then to perform, we have to be thinking about other things. And part of that is really living the moment of the music, which can help us communicate. I teach a class for grad students at the university called Peak Performance, and it's all about this kind of stuff. And some of the answers as to what, what negative things happen when, when my students perform is not feeling like they're communicating. So they're sort of stuck in that self-analysis of, oh, I don't wanna screw up. I do this better and I want to do that better and they forget about somehow we have to give something out to the audience so this is what singing is a wonderful way to do that because with all the mechanics of singing sort of inside in a way maybe it frees mm -hmm. oh this is great everybody's answering when they started that's great I love it so um we talked about or Professor Flava mentioned before ha having like a focus point or a keyword that uh, many athletes have that have to do with um, whatever physical action their sport requires. Um, I know, for example, golfers do, right, with the swing. There's one part of the swing they focus on that's a keyword right before, as opposed to you can't think of all of the things at once, right? We just can't. So having a focus point or keyword that helps you in performance again separating practice from performance that performance keyword is very helpful for me i have two it's breathing and express mm. and whatever is happening okay so here's a really <laughs> another really um hopefully quick story I played um, a competition years back uh, and it was kind of a big deal. It was like a young artist debut thing. And I went into the competition, it was all memorized and um, I was really, really well prepared. But as will happen, my read was not good. Whatever happened, my read was bad. I started playing and I felt like I sounded terrible. I mean, the tone was terrible. And there was nothing I could do about it. So I clearly remember the shift in my head about two lines into the piece. I can tell you the exact note that happened. I said to myself, well, at the very least, they're gonna walk out here and say, well, she sounded like crap, but she was really musical. And I just said, 
okay, whatever happens, I'm going to be just the most musical person they've ever heard because they're not going to walk out of here talking about how beautiful my sound is. And then I won. I won the competition, and um, which was a total surprise to me, but it taught me or reminded me that what I feel is going on for me instrument wise, I did not feel like I had a beautiful clarinet tone that day. And I can tell you in all honesty that I did not. Um, but I was expressive and I communicated and I put all my energy there because I couldn't put any energy into sounding beautiful tone wise because it wasn't there that day. So every ounce of energy I had went into creating colors and phrases and that's what that particular day moved those particular people. So um, it just highlighted to me how important the expression is. In performance, that's the whole point, the communication. So if you can get to where you can shift your mind when any chatter comes or any critique comes in, shift to communicating and expressing and it overrides that stuff. Just quickly, and I know we're getting low on time, but some, there are mechanics too of being musical. What is being musical? It's manipulating sound or color, and it's manipulating time, you know? So think about those two sort of, those are sort of the recipe, the base, very basic ingredients involved. If you're unsure about how to proceed with that, take your scale or something and play a scale with a crescendo and a diminuendo in the middle of it. Play where you're leading to the middle of the scale. You know, like you're almost rushing. You're, you're, you're driving forward to the middle of the, or to the top of the scale and then relaxing from the top down. Play uh, like Tchaikovsky, your scale. Play like Handel, your scale. Um, play like you're angry. Play like you're in love. You know, you. you Try that all with your scale, and you're just going to start to develop some different kinds of sounds. Because Dr. Donahue was talking about, I wanted to make this the most musical possible. She also had a vocabulary of different kinds of sounds. Um, so we need to stretch that. We need to work on that. That's really important to do. And another thing you can do, whether you have an audience or in front of you or not, is if you don't, you, you want to make sure that you take out one of your ears. You rip off your ear and you put it on the wall of your bedroom or your practice room and you play to that. So often we're focused on what's coming, you know, what we're doing to make sound rather than what's actually coming out. So that's something you can do. Oh, really listen outside of yourself. Awesome. I love that you guys are asking these questions along the way. Um, so let me... <laughs> answer Emmanuel really quickly. Yes, you should have three reads in your case. Um, you should have lots. And I can tell you, I mean, I get dozens of reads all the time. Um, it doesn't, environment, right, happens. And in this particular case, the read was feeling good. I walked out, I started playing. It didn't feel good anymore. It happens. And at that point, you can't stop and restart. Maybe if it was a performance, maybe if I was more in control of the concert itself, I actually would have. But in this competition venue, I was stuck. And that'll happen. And so you just shift, shift your focus. And Taib, that's a great question. Have you ever seen a player who practices and plays well, but does bad in a solo performance? I will tell you, I've played with some of the greatest musicians and some of the top ones say that all the time, that their performances were, were terrible compared to what they did in the practice room. However, as a listener, you still hear that brilliance. So, you know, we're all tough on ourselves. We are. Yeah. You guys all are. We all are. That is a wonderful thing in this world to expect more of ourselves. So that's fantastic. You don't want to beat yourself up, but you, you want to always be open to higher levels because yeah, under pressure, things are going to happen. Um, but you get to a certain level where even your worst is going to sound really great. Hmm. And, and that's pretty remarkable. Heifetz, the greatest violinist ever used to say, you know, I've had those moments where I've uh, played really well and the audience didn't get it. 
but then where I played really badly on the audience loved it. And he said, I always hated those moments because I'd get all those compliments and I felt so terrible. But he, he was feeling like he was playing bad for himself. And he was because he knows himself. But what came across was still great. I don't know if that answers the question, but, but I think it's a very interesting one to be thinking about. Mm -hmm. So we're starting to run out of time here. Mm -hmm. Any other questions Three from anyone? Minutes. You can either unmute and ask or just type them in. Well, performance, I think, is a fascinating thing, and it's partly because there's that, somebody mentioned about the adrenaline. They love the adrenaline. Yeah, there's that thrill of that. For me, what helps me, even if I'm really nervous, is feeling like I'm trying to share something with people. I, get, I try to get excited about the music I'm playing, uh, and that I want to share that with people. I love that. That's why I'm a teacher. I, I love trying to you know, connect with, with students who are interested in, in being better, and, and that's really exciting to me. Because, you know, guys, the world is full of people that close themselves off, especially grown-ups. So you guys are awesome because you're open, you're asking questions, and you're engaged. I hope I can stay that way till I'm 120 or whenever I die. Oh, best or most fun piece you played? Oh, oh, my goodness. Oh, I can't. I don't know. It's hard to choose one. There's such it riches. Is. There's such riches and become so invested in each one. Uh, that's tough. I love the Bach Chacon. Wonderful piece by Bach that just, if you don't know it, check it out. It, it goes about 15 minutes long and it's one pattern that has many variations and it's a whole world. It takes you on this journey and it's just one violin doing that. Yeah, I love it's that. amazing. Oh. Um, I just want to give you real quick a couple resources. Um, oh, actually, can you type them sure. in there? So there are a couple books that are... <laughs> <laughs> I'm ready. That are really, really good if you're interested in pursuing this. So if you're interested in learning how to quiet the chatter in your head, the inner game of or the inner game of music. Barry Green, is that right? Uh, I personally prefer the inner game of tennis, um, but the inner game of music is amazing. And then obviously puts all of the skills and tools directly to performance. Another is the Mindful Athlete. And that is uh, just, it obviously deals with athletics, but it's all the same stuff we've talked about. And it's very, very interesting, very valuable book. And it deals with just being in the moment, preparing and then performing and having all your faculties with you at that moment so that you can perform your very, very best. Uh, there's also a website, The Musician's Way, mm. and a lot of valuable information there as well. Awesome. What's the one with uh, 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 Noah Kagayama? The Musician's Way. Oh, that's Musician's Way. Okay, great. Yes. Yeah, so much great stuff out there. You guys are just awesome. And you know, you live in a great time where there's this information out there. So take charge, absolutely. You, you all have teachers and they're wonderful. You also can start on your journey to being your own teacher and, and fixing those problems, working on them. It's so exciting. It's, it's a lifetime of, of joy and excitement to do this. Yeah. Thank you, guys, you guys. It's been so great to spend this time with you. Thank you. Thank you.